Chapter 9 Taking Off to Jerusalem A few weeks later, I had graduated high school, passing my final exams with an HSE mark of 99.95%, the highest score possible. It had been an easy task for me, as I was born with a unique half seaton genome inherited from when I was Sabina Eisenstein. I was blessed with the Zetan abilities for heightened intelligence, telepathy and foresight. I would have easily scored 100% if only the computer systems that generate gradings of the entire school framework in Australia had been set up to do so. While I didn't particularly care for the result myself, I was happy that my results gave pride and joy for my humble parents. I arrived at the airport where my mum, dad, Eric and his girlfriend, Lindsay, came by to wish me safe travels to Jerusalem. In a way, it felt silly that they all came to wish me safe travels, as I only planned to stay away for a couple of weeks. But I knew the reason why, they all secretly feared that I wouldn't come back. I couldn't blame them for this. Going to Jerusalem was very dangerous, but I was happy that they kept a happy facade for my sake. I had experienced enough emotional talk from mum and dad the last few weeks, being just a naive and sappy 18-year-old girl. Another thing that made me happy was that Eric and Lindsay seemingly had found each other since the incident that happened at Joshua's party. This was important for me as that meant that the terrible things that happened at the party were not for nothing, and something good had come out of it at last. Eric looked happy together with Lindsay, and I had predicted that they would share a long and happy life together. I couldn't be sure though, as there were too many variables in life. They said that the only certainty in life was death, but even that rule could be bent. I had died fighting Rangda, and yet here I was, in another time and era, with different people around me, who loved me for being who I am. As I walked towards the passport control, my mum came after me and hugged me with tears in her eyes. I wish that I could come with you, she said. You can't go with me now, I said. But let's go together next year, when the balance of the universe is restored and peace reigns in the holy city. Hearing this, John looked dumbfounded and said, But what can change in just one year? Aren't you just going there for studying and school projects? Everything, I replied and smiled. After that, I hugged everyone and walked past the line indicating that I was in the international terminal. There were no passport controls anymore as everyone on earth was linked to a global database by 2037. And every movement on every airport was followed by an extensive network of cameras that utilized facial recognition as well as biometric data to determine the identity of everyone on the premises. While the system was not flawless, it was a lot safer than the previous method of passport controls, as passports were easier to forge than the global travel database was to be hacked by security hackers. I walked to my gate and suddenly I felt a bit of shame. I had spent the last few weeks trading extensively and made a lot of money, $200,000 to be exact. I had initially set out to travel with $20,000, but now I had over $200,000 in my account. And despite having more than I needed, I felt the urge to open my trading account and do some more trades. I decided to test myself. I intentionally bought the wrong stocks and lost $1,000. What did I feel about this? I didn't feel much at all. The lack of attachment to money was a relief to me, and it meant that greed had not taken a firm grip on me yet. Suddenly, I was gripped by an unnerving thought. 
What if things went badly in Jerusalem and I needed a way out? I realized that I was better off dividing my money into several accounts in case of an emergency and the best way to ensure that I have money available in case of an emergency was to open an emergency account where I stashed some of it into a universal cryptocurrency account. After doing some research, I decided that Splitcoin was my most viable option and I deposited half of my money into an encrypted Splitcoin account. I turned off my phone and walked on orbit flight 55222 to Tel Aviv. Orbit flight were aeroplanes that resembled a spacecraft. They flew at a higher altitude than regular planes. Cruising at 30,000 meters, they faced minimal air resistance and they could reach a top speed of MACH5, reducing the maximum travel time to anywhere on Earth to just 6 hours. The tickets were costly compared to regular flight tickets, but with my newfound talents in trading, I could afford them. When I got on the flight, I was offered a glass of French champagne, and to my big surprise, I accepted it. Oh well, I could always have a glass just for the occasion, I thought. Before finishing the drink and falling asleep in the very comfortable leather armchair that I was sitting in, on the uber-fast plane. Chapter 10. A City Filled with Fear I woke up a few hours later upon the uber-fast plane landing on Tel Aviv International Airport. I was immediately immersed by the strong sense of fear that was gripping the entire country. It broke my heart that these holy lands had fallen so far away from the paradises that they were meant to be. What had happened to love thy neighbor? As I reached immigration, I was subjected to a new technology that took a 3D scan of my body and detected my movement patterns so that I would be possible for the AI to identify through scanning my body type and my movement pattern even if I had concealed my face. While I was impressed by the technology, it also frightened me. The people in power were continually looking for new ways to control the population and the fear-mongering was getting worse. In the past, it had been enough to leave your phone and your credit cards at home if you wanted some alone time. But now it was almost impossible. Paradoxically, the more the government could track the population, the lonelier everybody got. In a culture where no one trusted their fellow men, no one came out as the winner. After having my movement patterns and body scanned for an extended period of time, I was brought into a room for further questioning. A stern-looking security officer studied me with his predatory eyes, and I could feel that this individual was quite content with the current state of affairs. Sabina Hines, why have you come to Israel? The man asked with a voice filled with suspicion. The security officer's hostility frustrated me as he was acting out on his fear, which in turn made the fear spread. And society as a whole was turning more and more fearful and dangerous. I decided to not confront the officer for his attitude and instead play along with his little game. I have come to this holy land to learn more about myself and my heritage, I said with a serious and sanctimonious voice. Is that so? The man asked rhetorically before continuing. Our sources in Sydney state that you rarely visit the synagogue and that you work as a yoga teacher. I studied the man in bewilderment. I had travelled to multiple places on family holidays throughout the years and never had I had a government spy on me before I arrived on a tourist visa. If my quest to Jerusalem had not been so important, I would have said thanks but no thanks and returned home. 
But my journey here was of utmost importance, and the decline of the Holy Land had really proven to me how essential it was that I find and purify the Zito crystal to bring back kindness and trust into this world. What do you have to say for yourself? The man's aggressive voice interrupted my thoughts. I hate it when my mind wanders, but I had to snap back to the present. What you say is true. I have been trying different paths to spiritual awareness throughout my life. The spirituality I have tried is not contradicting the first commandment, however, as I have not worshipped any other gods, I said with an imploring voice. The man studied me for a while and spoke. Very well, because of the good standing of your father, John Hines, I will grant you your entry to Israel, but we will be watching you. The menacing security officer stamped my passport. I thanked him and I was on my way. I felt a sense of relief that I had not needed to use my powers to get past him. I felt a need to function as a human and not just rely on spiritual meditative powers every time I needed to get things my way. Besides, I could feel that the security officer's soul was filled with xenophobic hatred and paranoia. And the less I exposed my soul to those kinds of feelings, the better. I grabbed an auto car to Jerusalem and an hour later I arrived at my hotel scanned my beautiful blue set of irises at the blast-proof security checkpoint, and got in. Tired from the exposure to paranoia and suspicion, I retreated to my room where I meditated for hours to regain balance and to calm myself down before I could finally go to sleep. <laughs> Chapter 11. The Suicide Bomber The day after, I woke up refreshed. The sun was shining and it was a crisp winter breeze coming in through my window when I opened it. After eating breakfast, I set out to explore Jerusalem on foot. While most guidebooks strongly recommended guided tours with bulletproof vehicles, I felt that I didn't want to give in to fear. Besides, I was looking for clues on the whereabouts of the Zito crystal, and I believed that my senses would be better attuned to find them if I were out in the open, slowly walking around the city. But Jerusalem was large, so where would I start my exploring? I realized that since it was a Saturday and I was clearly under surveillance by the government, the natural choice would be to go to the Western Wall and pray. I don't like praying to deities, following specific rites and gathering at specific man-made buildings. I see this merely as a symptom of man's vanity to worship gods created by man for men. The true maker is everywhere. She is the universe. And any place is as good as the other to connect to her. What is important is the mindset of the individual, not the location or the ritual. Casting aside my own preferences, I approached the wall and I sensed something magical. Could it be that the Zito crystal was nearby? Suddenly, the sensation was dulled by another feeling, the strong feeling of danger and fear. I turned around and I saw a young man around my age. His face was solemn and he was reciting his prayers, but this was only a facade. This man was here to harm himself and the others. I quickly touched the man's hand to get a better read of his emotional state and to get a sense of who this strange person was. Yusuf was a 17-year-old Palestinian man struggling with severe depression. Unfortunately, instead of finding help to deal with his problems, he had come across evil men, 
men that would manipulate him into killing himself and others so that perpetual vicious cycle of hate, fear and paranoia could continue. Although I had not come to Jerusalem to save individuals, I had to save Yusuf from himself. My life and the lives of countless others depended on it. I grabbed his hand tightly to establish a telepathic link. I didn't say anything, partly because it would be hard to talk with him with all noise around us, especially since I could not speak Arabic, but also because I didn't want to arouse panic in the people around me. If the worshippers found out about the suicide bomber among them, they would run away in panic, and in the stampede that ensued, people could get harmed or even die. Don't do it! There is still hope! I communicated to Yusuf telepathically. Yusuf stared at me in awe and replied, Who are you? How can you get inside my mind? Does it even matter? I replied before continuing. All that matters is that everyone here can go home safe and sound, and I can help you build a better life. I saw tears running down Yusuf's cheeks, and he replied with, I believe you, but it is too late. I had already activated the bomb when you contacted me. Yusuf stood up, shouted, Allah, Allah. Shortly afterwards, I saw the bright flash from the detonation followed by Yusuf's body disintegrating into blood and flesh from the terrible force of the bomb. The shockwave from the bomb knocked me unconscious and my mind was transported to the divine dimension. There I saw the true maker taking the form of my first mother, Kayla Eisenstein. She spoke with an urging voice. Sabina, you must be careful. You cannot fall here. Get up. I woke up and I studied the carnage around me. My head was pounding, my ears were ringing, my eyes were blinded by the flash, and I was covered in blood. How badly wounded was I? I got up on my feet and concluded that I wasn't that bad off, but... Dead and wounded people covered the ground around me, and I could hear people's screams in pain and terror. I desperately needed to find inner peace, so I started walking towards my hotel to have a purifying shower. I got to the hotel and entered the shower, the warm water washed away the blood, and the shock and terror slowly receded from my body. I didn't have the time to find inner peace though, as the room was suddenly raided by heavily armed police shortly afterwards, bringing me with them. Chapter 12 Meeting up with the namesake of a future enemy I was locked up in a police interrogation room. It had been several hours. My head was pounding, and worst of all, I suffered from a terrible thirst as no one had acknowledged my place for a glass of water. The door opened, and in came the same security officer that had cautioned me at the airport the day before. I stared at him in disbelief. Why had the immigration officer from the airport come all the way to question me? The man somehow sensed my confusion and stretched out a hand to greet me. Miss Sabina Hines, we meet again. I didn't introduce myself the last time we met. I am Special Agent Dov Durovich from Mossad Spy Agency. Dov Durovich. The name gave me shivers. It was the name of the genocidal dictator on Mars that I had defeated as a seven-year-old in 2882, eight and a half centuries into the future. Could this be the same person, or was it just a coincidence that they had the same name? I studied the man in front of me. Clearly, it wasn't the same soul, nor the same appearance. 
and it was just the stress that caused my mind to play tricks on me. Dove spoke again. So, Miss Hines, security footage shows that you were holding the hand of the suicide bomber and looking him in the eyes just moments before the explosion went off. Do you care to elaborate? I realized that I would have to use my divine powers to get me out of this mess. After all, Dove was difficult enough at the airport without a terrorist attack taking place. I wanted to try talking first, however, so I responded. Yes, he seemed to be agitated, so I tried to calm him down. Sadly, I couldn't do it. Dove studied me in silence for a while. I didn't know if he was thinking of anything or if silence and observation were his interrogation approach. Eventually, he spoke. The terrorist was carrying a bomb belt with a dozen bombs filled with shrapnel. Nine of these bombs went off, killing and maiming a lot of innocent people. The three that didn't go off were the ones facing you. I want you to tell me why these three bombs didn't explode. Dove's tone and implied accusations made me upset. I had survived a tragedy and instead of receiving treatment and proper care, I was exposed to toxic accusations by the man in front of me. I snapped at Dove and yelled out, I don't know why those bombs didn't go off. Maybe Yusuf defused them. I bit my tongue and realized my mistake. I hadn't spoken to Yusuf and yet I knew his name. This wouldn't help to prove my innocence, and I would have to use my powers to get out of this mess. As anticipated, Dove picked up on this detail, and he screamed back at me. How do you know the name of the terrorist? You arrived yesterday, and you're not seen talking to him before the explosion. I froze. I needed to come up with something to convince Dove of my innocence. but. Would the best way be to make up a story on how I knew Yusuf's name, or should I aim to address the elephant in the room, how Yusuf managed to pass the security checkpoints? I decided to go with the latter. I grabbed Dove's hand and focused my empath ability to influence his mind. What you should really focus on, I paused for a second, trying to come up with the words before continuing is how Yusuf managed to get past the security checkpoints unnoticed on his way to the Western Wall. I studied Dove as his facial expression was changing. I had managed to influence him in the right direction, and hopefully the input would lead him to the real villains behind this heinous crime. With a concerned expression on his face, Dove replied, I believe you, Sabina. Our efforts need to be put towards finding the ones responsible for letting Yusuf through our security checkpoints. After this, Dove pressed a button and leaned towards me, whispering in my ear. I have turned off the recording. I can sense that you are special. Please help me find the ones responsible for this crime. Dove's request surprised me. I had hoped that he would believe me and let me go. But asking me, an outsider, to help with his investigation? Had he sensed my powers, or was he testing me? I took a tighter grip of Dove's hand and established a telepathic connection with him. Why do you need me to help you, Dove? I asked. I knew it. You're an empath. I will get you out of here. Just follow my lead. Dove replied, and before I knew it, he was leading me out of the room. Dove grabbed me by the arm and was intercepted by one of his colleagues. Where are you taking that girl? She is still a suspect. Dove's colleague remarked. I'm taking her back to the hotel. She is innocent and had a plausible explanation on how she knew the terrorist's name. Dove snarked. Before his colleague had the time to answer, 
Dove dragged me into the elevator and we ended up in the basement of the building. He led me to his car. Get in the car, he commanded. I'd rather just catch a taxi back to the hotel, I replied. Dove opened his coat showcasing the pistol he had holstered. Get in the car now. I don't like asking twice. Dove hissed at me. I nodded and got in the car. Dove got in the driver's seat and drove away from the garage quickly. I sat in the car and pondered what I would do for the next half an hour. Dove drove fast, too quick for the conditions as it was heavy raining and there were thunderstorms in the sky. I realized that I had been too careless when Dove suddenly turned off from the main road and turned onto a small gravel road with no street lights. I was now alone with an armed and unstable man and I really hoped that he would be a friend and not a foe. After driving for 10 minutes, we arrived at a small, seemingly abandoned shed. Get out! Dove hissed and I exited the car. The cold winter rain chilled through my bones and the coldness amplified the fear I felt being at this spooky location. Suddenly, I heard gunfire and I took cover on the ground. <coughs> Chapter 13 Saved by the Lightning I lay in a puddle while the shooting took place. With my hands firmly grounded to the earth, I could feel the planet speaking to me and I momentarily lost track of time and place. As the shooting ended, I saw Dove lying on the other side of the car. It seemed like he was dead. I got up and I saw that Dove's colleague from the police station was approaching me and instantly I felt a sense of relief. You saved me. That deluded man brought me here at gunpoint, talking about conspiracies and stuff, I said timidly. Silly girl, the man exclaimed. Dove was correct. There is a conspiracy within the security agency that allows the operation and funding of terrorist attacks, he continued. So I guess you're not here to save me then, hey? I replied. The man laughed menacingly and said, You're catching on just fine. Dove Dervich was kidnapped and murdered by the foreign terrorist supporter Sabina Hines. I, Special Agent Jakub Kluger intercepted the terrorist and killed her when she tried to get away. The man replied with an evil grin on his face. I studied him carefully, planning on my next move, but I didn't say anything. Jakub raised his gun and aimed it at me. Any last words? he asked with a mocking tone. I could feel his aura, I knew that the sociopath in front of me wanted me to beg for my life, to make him feel powerful, but I wouldn't succumb to it. Instead, I opted to reply defiantly. Any last words? I have another 94 years to think about that. I warn you, however, put that gun down and surrender, or else Things will end badly for you. I could sense a moment of hesitation reaching Jakub's mind. I expected him to be killing from behind his desk by ordering others to do his dirty deeds. To murder an innocent girl while staring into her eyes would not be as easy for him, especially not when the innocent girl was me. A girl with gifted powers bestowed upon me by the true maker. A dozen of very tense seconds ensued until I suddenly could sense that Jakub was going to shoot me for real. Being able to sense his thought pattern in advance, I managed to time my action perfectly, to jump away instantly, avoiding the bullet and landing on the ground in the split second it took for his mind to send the signal to his finger to pull the trigger. The shot missed as I landed safely into a muddy puddle. 
From my position, I could see that Jakub changed his aim to take another shot at me, and there was no way I could avoid this shot. The shot never happened though, as Jakub was struck by a bright lightning flash from the sky caused by the raging thunderstorms. His metallic pistol had fortunately acted as a lightning rod, drawing electricity towards him, and thus his decision to kill an innocent girl to cover up his heinous crimes had ended up being his own undoing. I got up on my feet, and I studied the two pathetic men on the ground. I wanted to save Dove, now that Jakub had told me the truth. But it was too late as he was already dead. Jakub was still alive, but unconscious and was dying from the lightning strike. He could be saved, but did he deserve to live on? If he was brought back to life, there was no evidence against him except for my words. And if things came to worst, I would become the scapegoat for Jakub and the people that he worked for meaning that they could keep killing and hurting the innocents so they could retain their power through intimidation and fear. I studied Jakub's pistol that was lying on the ground next to him. I felt enticed to pick it up. If people were out to kill me, I needed to protect myself. I shook my head at the notion I didn't have the right to take people's lives and that was not the mandate I was given, and besides people that owned guns were much more likely to die gun-related deaths than people who didn't own guns. If I took up a gun to take another person's life, I would have fallen, and it was simply not the path I wanted to take. I decided to leave Jakub to die as I didn't feel compelled to save the man who had tried to murder me, and I entered Dove's car to drive back to the main road. Once I got close to the main road, I got out of the car and ordered an auto car using Dove's phone as it would be unwise to drive around in a car stolen from a murder victim. I directed the auto car to drive me to a discreet building where I had paid for a room using cryptocurrency. I knew that Mossad still had my phone and my passport, which was a complication, but I simply had to settle for what I had. <laughs> Chapter 14 Limping and Incognito I woke up the following morning in the worn-down room as there was a knock on my door. I opened the door and there in front of me was a handsome-looking woman around my age. She was slim, tall and had a boyish haircut and was clothed like a computer hacker equipped with a cool-looking laptop and a stereo-sonic headphone with a loud music banging. She delivered my package, and without saying a word, she left. I opened the package, and I was grateful that I had found a good dark web online shopping last night, which delivered the promised delivery instead of robbing me of my cryptocurrency or tracing me and turning me over to the authorities. The package contained a set of clothes, a laptop, a cell phone, a fake ID, a prepaid credit card and a pair of sunglasses. I put on the clothes and realized that it was used clothes. The same could be said for the phone and laptop that I had also ordered, but there wasn't much to say about it. After all, Beggars couldn't be choosers, and I was happy that they had delivered my package at all. I checked the internet to see how I could outsmart the security cameras that were located everywhere. Apparently, a hoodie and sunglasses were a good start, but since the security cameras also detected a person's movement pattern, I needed a more radical change to fool them. 
I concluded that the damage caused by jumping into the puddle to avoid Dove's bullet had twisted my ankle, and with a slight injury on my shoulder, my walking movements would not be detected by AI as it would think I was someone else. I wasn't a fan of self-inflicted damage, but realized that I was here on a mission, and so I had no other choice. Firstly, I deliberately slammed my shoulder forcefully into the wall, dropping to the floor in agony and pain. Hating what I would have to do next, I kicked the wall with my bare foot, causing my ankle to twist even more. Once the pain had receded from the self-inflicted damage, I got up. Studying myself in the mirror, I realized that the pain had indeed caused me to stand up and walk differently from before. Although, definitely, not for the better. I put on my hoodie and my sunnies, and I got out to commence my search for the Zito crystal. As I exited the room that I had hired anonymously, I damned myself for my immoral cowardice the night before. By letting Yakub die, I also killed off the trail to the conspiracy that was holding Jerusalem and its inhabitants as hostages. What if the conspiracy was somehow linked to the Zito crystal? I hadn't thought about it in my agitated state the previous night, but now the question overwhelmed me with relentless force. I realized that the moral dilemma was irrelevant now. I was here on a mission, and my mission was to find and cleanse the Sito crystal to make Earth a better place, not saving the lives of cold-blooded murderers who had tried to kill me. But how would I find the Sito crystal, and where would I begin my search? I realized that I had felt a tingling sensation at the western wall just before Yusuf and his suicide homicidal plans had shattered the peace. But the Western War Precinct was probably in lockdown after the previous day's terrorist attack. I decided to explore the remaining parts of the old town on foot, as it wasn't very suitable for traversing in a driverless cab. It was painful walking on my rolled ankle, but it was unfortunately the only way to cheat the automated AI cameras. I just hoped that my injured state would not attract the attention of the local police. I walked around in the local quarters for an hour, sensing that the Zito crystal was somewhat near, but not close enough for me to pinpoint its location. I froze as someone screamed at me from behind. Mishtara! Mishtara! It meant nothing to me, as I don't speak Hebrew, but I turned around and much to my dismay, I was facing a police officer in combat gear. I don't understand, I said as the police officer faced me. Take off your sunglasses and show me your ID, the police officer stated with an assertive voice. I froze for a moment angled myself away from the facial recognition security cameras, hoping that the police officer would not recognize me. After that, I took off my sunglasses and showed him my fake ID. The police officer studied my fake ID and my face for a while. He nodded, forced a smile, and spoke. Thank you, Miss Kayla Essenstein. Do you need a medical assistant with your limp? I smiled back in relief and replied, No, it's just a minor sporting injury. I should be fine in due time. I responded to the officer. Very well, carry on then, civilian. The police officer said this and walked away from me. I was relieved that I didn't need to use my powers to get out of the situation and I was also relieved that there evidently was not a warrant for my arrest out. Otherwise, the police officer would have studied me and my ID more closely, as I had used my future mother's name on the identification card. 
I walked into a small alleyway and made my way into a small coffee shop. I ordered some peppermint tea to calm my very tense nerves. Chapter 15 Meeting with the Templars As I was enjoying my peppermint tea and relaxing my nerves, I was approached by a group of three shady-looking characters wearing white Middle Eastern robes and turbans that covered most of their faces. I freaked out at first. Had the conspirators within Mossad sent assassins after me, as Yakub had failed to kill me? I was relieved when the leader of the three men spoke. Kyla Eisenstein, we have been looking for you. I studied the man. He was in his fifties and looked strangely out of place in the surrounding that he was with, as the other two men were Arabic and of Middle Eastern appearance, while he was tall, blonde, with sharp icy blue eyes, and had a very fair and stunning North European ancestry. But why was he looking for my mother from the future, Kayla Eisenstein? And should I play along with the ploy? I decided to do so. Yes, I'm Kayla Eisenstein, I replied before continuing. Who am I speaking to? I added confidently. The mysterious man bowed to me and replied. I'm Martin Alsham. I have been looking for you for almost 20 years. I gave him a puzzled look and replied. But I'm only 18. Surely you must have mistaken me for another person. He responded and said, You think I might be mistaken, but I'm sure it is you that I'm looking for. You are the Kayla Eisenstein that I have seen in my visions. You are the one that Brahma had told me to find. The wise man replied with a solemn and knowing voice, as if he had been struggling for years to have come to this epiphanic moment. As confusing as the man's statement were, it all made sense to me. I was struggling with the mission that the true maker had assigned to me, and I realized that the appearance of this strange man must be the intervention of the true maker herself. I looked Martin Alsham deeply into his striking icy blue eyes and spoke. If that is so, Martin, then how can I be of assistance? The man nodded at me and pulled off his sleeve, revealing a strangely glowing tattoo on his right arm. I was meant to show you this tattoo that I received through a sleepless dream. In it, there are strange codes and intelligent markings, and I have failed to decipher them for the last decades, and so has everyone I've ever known. But you will understand them as you are the chosen one. I watched the strangely captivating and illuminating tattoo. The markings and codes were strange and alien in origin, but they didn't mean anything to me. In a way, this made sense. I wasn't Kayla Eisenstein after all. I tried touching the tattoo and I could feel a deep psionic message. And yet I couldn't understand it. There is a message conveyed in those intelligent markings and coding. And yet I cannot understand it, I said. But you have to understand it. You are the only one that could open the portal to another dimension, the man said and I could spot the desperation and plea in his wise eyes. Martin continued speaking. I joined with the Templars after the incident 20 years ago, the incident where I traveled to the Divine Dimension and met with the Zetans, who urged me to seek Kayla Eisenstein and gave me these undecipherable markings on my arm. 
I froze as I heard this and I realized that this man must be crucial to the success of my mission. Zito Crystal? I'm looking for the primordial Zito Crystal, I said. Martin nodded in acknowledgement and replied. Yes, I know what you're talking about. I once bought a tiny blue crystal in a shady Egyptian market many years ago as a Swedish tourist, just days before I entered the portal to another dimension. I didn't realize it was a Zito crystal. Once I woke up in the hospital, I decided to get a permanent residency in Israel, change my surname to Al-Sham, and join the Middle Eastern Templars, as I realized that they and I were looking for the same thing. The Holy Grail, or as you call it, the Primordial Zito Crystal. I felt excited hearing this good news, but also a hint of apprehension came to me. Who were these mysterious men and why were they looking for the Primordial Zito Crystal? While it was a good sign that they were also looking in Jerusalem, it could also be a sign of immediate danger to both myself and the world. I realized that I could use my empath powers to read Martin's mind, but before I had the chance, there was a loud banging on the door, followed by... This is the police! Open the door now! Upon hearing this, Martin immediately got up and said, Quickly, get into that ventilation shaft over there. We will delay them. I realized that time was short, but before I escaped, I had the mental presence to take a picture of Martin's tattoos on his right arm so that I could decipher them later. I got into the ventilation shaft, but my curiosity got the better of me, and I felt compelled to stay hidden and see how things would unfold. Chapter 16 A Mysterious Enemy I witnessed a small cafe from above the ceiling where Martin and the other two Templars were standing as Martin approached the door to open it for the police to enter. A few masked police officers dressed in combat gear approached the room with drawn weapons and they were followed by a mysterious man who I assumed was their leader. The mysterious leader was dressed in a long coat, wearing a monocle and a top hat and looked very much out of place, both in time and location. I could sense a strong evil aura from the man and it terrified me and gave me the chills. Where is the girl? The man hissed to Martin. Martin said, What girl? I don't know what you're talking about. Stranger said, You know exactly which girl I'm talking about? Kayla Eisenstein. That is why you came here, isn't it? Martin said, perhaps, but Alice, I didn't find her. The stranger said, you need to be more careful with your words, Martin. Accidents happen so easily. Martin said, what is this girl to you anyway? Why is she a person of interest to you, Ben Yehuda? Ben Yehuda said, she is the key to find the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is destined to change mankind as we know it. I cannot let that happen. Martin said, What if she is to change it for the better? Ben Yehuda said, Bah! We are living at the best of times, and my masters are close to achieving their goal of World Dominance. I'm giving you one last chance to save your life, Martin. Where would the girl be heading to? Martin said, 
Perhaps she is headed to the Templar tunnels under the great temple of Solomon. Then Yehuda said, Yes, perhaps. In any case, you have outlived your usefulness, Martin. Greet you, heaven gods, from me. Having said this, Ben Yehuda aimed his gun at the chest of Martin and shot him with several bullets. And that was the signal for his accomplices to do the same and kill the other two Arabic Templars. Hiding in the ventilation shaft just above them, I was petrified from watching the murders took place. But I kept my calm, and slowly and silently, I crawled away through the shaft, away from the scene. I needed to find a new hiding place and a new identity before it was too late. Carla Eisenstein was clearly not a good name to use in this city to avoid attention. I logged into my split coin account and ordered the closest available safe house. I then followed the ventilation shaft to its exit leading out to the main street. After that, I followed the instructions on my phone to make my way to the safe hiding place. I made my way to the abandoned empty house where I collapsed in tears on the bed as soon as I had locked the door behind me. Chapter 17 Traumatized in the Safe House I woke up the following day traumatized and unable to get out of the lice-ridden bed. I was shaking from shock and I had lost all resolve to get on with life. Here I was, a fugitive in foreign land, having witnessed several murders and barely survived the ordeal. All I wanted to do was to be held in my present mother's arms and be comforted as when I was a child. I had felt a similar sense of apathy after Joshua tried to rape me a few months earlier but at the time it was easier. Back then, I had been in a safe place and Joshua had never posed any real threat to me, although it did hurt my spirit to know what damage my self-defense had caused upon him. I looked at my encrypted phone. All I wanted was to call my mother and speak to her. I knew that she would be worried sick as I had promised to call her every night, and I had failed that promise. But then I stopped myself. My phone and my personal belongings were in Mozart's possession, which meant that they knew who my mother was by now. And they certainly were monitoring any calls or electronic communications that were made in her direction. If I called my mum, the Mossad would know and they would track my location and come after me. But what if I called Lindsay, Eric's girlfriend, instead? She was not closely aligned to me, but she could still let my mother know that I was alive. I dialed Lindsay's number and a few signals later she picked up the phone. Hello, Lindsay speaking. Who is this? she said. It's me, Sabina. I need you to tell my parents that I'm alive, I said to her. Oh, has something happened? Show yourself in a hologram mode, Lindsay asked me. I cannot show myself. They would find me. I need to go, I stated as I hung up the phone abruptly. I collapsed on the bed and dreamt terrifying dreams about the murders that I had witnessed the days before. I woke up with a twist, realizing something strange. There was no blood in the visions where Martin and his fellow Templars were murdered. Did this mean that the murders were staged, or was my mind simply playing a trick on me? I needed to find out 
and to be safe. I ordered a new ID, new clothes, and a new phone and some cash, as I reckoned cash was less traceable than a prepaid credit card. I checked my split coin account. Buying things illegally was not cheap, and I hoped I wouldn't run out of money. A few hours later, the same young hacker girl came and delivered my package, and just as before, she didn't say anything at all when doing so, quickly delivered the parcel and left. I studied my ID card. Hopefully, Eleanor Smith would not attract as much unwanted attention as the name Kayla Eisenstein had done. I got dressed and set out to investigate the crime scene I had witnessed the day before. Chapter 18 A Dead End and a Clue A short walk later, I arrived at the coffee shop where I had witnessed the murders the day before. Or rather, I arrived at the location where the coffee shop had been, as the building was suddenly raised overnight. Raising the building where a triple murder took place couldn't possibly be a normal police procedure, so clearly something suspicious was amiss. I knocked on the neighbor's door and she reluctantly came out to answer the knock. What happened here? I asked the neighbor. Why should you know? She snarled at me. I'm not from here, but I can make it worth your while. I replied as I pulled out a bunch of 100 shekel bills. I could see the internal dilemma the woman was facing. On the one hand, she was a poor Palestinian who really needed the money. On the other hand, Helping a foreigner the day after the neighboring property was destroyed was certainly not safe. I reached out and grabbed her hand and looked into her eyes. Please help me, it's important, I said, and the woman's face changed, and she became friendlier. Come in, she said this, and I entered the small house. I handed her the pile of notes and she invited me to sit down by a small table. So, what happened next door? I asked. There was a gunfire and a while later, six men left the building. Shortly afterwards, a missile hit the building and it collapsed, the woman said. What about the other customers in the cafeteria? I asked. Cafeteria? It was just a home, not a place of business, the woman replied with a puzzled look on her face. I tried to recall what had occurred on the day before. Had I really walked into someone's home, believing that it was a coffee shop and ordered tea? It wasn't impossible. I had been quite riled up the previous day. The man that left. Can you describe them? I asked the woman. Yes, there were six of them, two police officers in combat gear, one man in a brown trench coat, and three tall hooded men in white robes, the woman replied. This confirmed my suspicion. The murders that I thought I witnessed yesterday was fake and staged by a group of high-level conspirators. But why would they do such a thing and what should I do? Is there anything else you can tell me? I asked the woman. These are dangerous questions. A poor woman like me should never reveal too much or else I will get shot by the authorities. The woman replied nervously. I reached in my pocket for another pile of banknotes, but before I had reached them, the woman spoke again. I found this outside the house. One of the men must have dropped it. The woman handed me a police ID. 
I took the ID and I gave her another 100 shekel bill as a gratitude. I put the ID in my pocket and spoke. Anything more you can tell me? I asked. Please don't ask any more. I have children to look after. The woman stammered as she was close to tears. I understand. Thank you for your assistance and I will pray for you. I said reassuringly. Knowing that I could not get more information of value from this terrified Palestinian woman, I turned around and made my way back to the safe house. I knew exactly who I would ask for help in this tricky situation. Chapter 19 Seeking help from the young hacker girl. As I came back to my safe hiding place, I visited the same site on the dark web that I had ordered from twice before. I didn't need to buy anything, but I needed to meet with the young hacker girl that had delivered my last two deliveries. I put through the order and waited eagerly for it to be delivered hoping that it would be delivered by the same girl as before. While I was waiting, I realized that I was starving. With all the stress from the last few days' events, I had forgotten to eat. I decided to order the food from the same website as I didn't want to be away from the room when the girl came with the delivery. I hoped that the food would be worth the hefty price tag, but I had no illusions. The prices were steep because of the secrecy of the platform, not because of the quality of the food. A few hours later, the young hacker girl came again with yet another delivery. But this time, I wouldn't let her leave without saying a word. I grabbed her hand and said, Hey, wait! We need to talk. I don't know your name yet. I could sense anxiety from the lanky, boyish girl opposite to me, and I tried to send her a calming emotion. This was a lot harder than it usually was for me, as my own inner peace had been upset by the events I had witnessed. But eventually, she seemed a bit calmer. What do you want to talk about? The girl said carefully, staring her down into the floor. You don't need to be afraid of me, I said, and I put a reassuring hand on her shoulder. The girl looked up and I saw her eyes. She had beautiful features, hidden by her boyish and alternative good looks. She talked softly and said, Perhaps not. But for someone who spends nearly 100,000 shekel on discreet accommodation, clothing necessities, laptops, and fake IDs, you must be up to something. I nodded to acknowledge what the girl said and replied. Yes, I'm here on a mission, but first, what do you know about the conspiracy within the Mossad? The girl shook her head and replied. There are many conspiracies in the world, but the only way for someone like me to survive is to stay off the grid and don't put my nose where it doesn't belong. Hearing this, I pondered on what the girl had said. She was doing the right thing by staying out of trouble, but I really needed her help. Then again, what moral rights did I have to risk her life and well-being by pursuing my own goals? I closed my eyes and I could hear the voice of the true maker. Human lives are finite. The future is what matters. I felt relieved that I had gotten approval, but I was still uncomfortable with what I had to do. I looked the girl into her eyes and hypnotized her with my soft and yet commanding voice. I said, Listen, I really need your help. It's important for all of us, for the future of all humankind. Upon hearing these words, 
The girl suddenly relaxed, and she entered my room, closing the door behind her. Okay, Sabina Hines, I will help you," she said. "How do you know my name?" I asked. I wouldn't last long in my line of business if I didn't know how to research my potential customers," the girl promptly replied. I nodded in acknowledgement. This hacker girl clearly knew what she was doing. So you know everything about me, but I don't even know your name," I said in return. Simona, Simona Fishkpain is my name," the girl replied. Is that your real or false name? I asked. Well, names are just imaginary, a human construct that doesn't exist in nature. Simona Fishkpain is not the name my parents chose for me, but it is the name I'm using at this moment," the girl smartly replied. I nodded, while Simona had used a lengthy way of telling me that she was using a fake name. I understood her predicament, and I didn't want to push the issue further. "You are very beautiful, Sabina," Simona said to me, while looking nervously down the ground before she continued. "Do you feel the same way about me?" I was a bit lost for words when hearing this. Was Simona sexually attracted to me, or was she just a lonely girl that needed a compliment? What matters is the beauty of the soul, and I don't know you well enough to determine the beauty of your soul. I started and then quickly added in, but I'm very grateful for your compliment and helping me out with this conundrum. Simona seemed to be hesitant and indecisive for a while. But eventually she spoke. But have you been with a girl before? Ouch! This was awkward. Being a divine reincarnation of the chosen one, Sabina Eisenstein, the daughter of Kayla Eisenstein. I do not focus much of my energy on sex and physical attraction. I do know, however, that my physical body. Is attracted to boys my age. I had felt very attracted to a guy called Alexander in my school, but I had never pursued that attraction. I felt no spiritual connection to him, purely physical attraction, and I hadn't figured out whether I should pursue the desire of the flesh or if I should wait for the individual that would fulfill me both physically and spiritually. Things were getting more awkward as Simona somehow was interpreting my silence as a signal to seduce me, and I could feel an unpleasant shiver when her hand stroked the side of my breast. Um, I'm not comfortable being touched that way," I said with a meek voice. "Am I too ugly for you?" Simona said, with her voice breaking into tears. No, you are beautiful. I'm just not into girls," I replied. Simona crashed onto my bed, and with tears flowing down her cheeks, "Do you know how hard it is for me, being a lesbian in a country where my desires are shunned upon and I can't leave openly?" Simona said. I grabbed Simona's hand and I spoke to her. Simona. The increasing oppression in this region is terrible, and I'm here to help. But to do that, I'll need your help," I said. Simona dried her tears with the bed sheet and replied, "But I need you right now." Well, you cannot have me without disrespecting my physical integrity. Surely you wouldn't want to do that," I replied. But I thought we have such a strong connection," Simona said. "What you believe to be physical attraction was actually me trying to connect telepathically to your soul. I am an empath, not a lesbian," I replied calmly. After a moment of tranquil silence, where I telepathically soothed Simona's struggling mind, 
Simona finally came to peace and she spoke again. So, why are you here and how can I help you? I exhaled deeply, pleased that I was no longer an object of Simona's unrequited attraction, and replied, I'm here because I need to find something, the primordial Zito crystal, commonly known as the Holy Grail. Simona studied me and then she nodded. So, you were a young white girl traveling on her own, all the way from Australia, to seek a mythological Arthurian treasure. Simona said, Yes, that's right, I said with a light-hearted tone, hoping to ease up the tension in the dark yet cozy room. For the first time, I saw Simona smile, a beautiful warm smile, and she replied, You are crazy. We must be soulmates. Perhaps spiritually, but not physically, I replied. I guess that's better than nothing, Simona replied, and we both laughed at the funniness of the awkward friendship budding situation. So tell me, how can I help you? Simona said with a more serious tone, and I replied. Okay, I'm looking for the primordial Zito crystal, which I think is the Holy Grail. I was shown this strange-looking tattoo by a mysterious man. The same man then pretended to be murdered by a group of Mossad agents. One of the agents dropped his ID card at the scene. After saying this, I showed Simona the picture of the tattoo that I took on my cell phone and handed her the ID card of Ben Yehuda, the mysterious Mossad agent. Simona nodded and studied the pictures and the ID card carefully. She quickly opened up her laptop and typed and searched her way through the dark web, looking for answers on a discreet hacker forum. Eventually she spoke. I have made anonymous and untraceable queries on the dark web. I think you might be onto something thrilling. I could feel my pulse rising in anticipation as I replied. Please tell me what you know, Simona. Martin Alsham is a prominent member of the Templar Order. If he is in Jerusalem, that must mean that they have resumed an archaic project, Simona said. Which project, I asked. Simona hesitated for a bit, looked around in the room, and then spoke again. In the year 1099, the Templars invaded Jerusalem during the First Crusade. They located their headquarters at the Temple of Solomon and immediately started to dig under the temple. Simona answered, What did they find and why did they stop digging? I asked eagerly. No one knows, but rumor has it that they found the Holy Grail. They took off with all their treasures in the year 1307, and the Templar Order has not been seen since, Simona stated, except that Martin al-Sham had introduced himself as the Templar, so they're not seeking secrecy anymore, I said in realization. Simona paced back and forth nervously in the room before she finally spoke again. Yes, they are getting bolder. That must mean that they have found what they're looking for. The first place to look would be in the tunnels under the Solomon Temple, she said nervously. I assume they are not organizing tours down there, I said innocently. Simona smiled and replied, not exactly, but that's where you're lucky to have known me. I can make you a fake ID that will give you easy access. She smirked and looked at me wittily. Except that your services are not exactly cheap, and I have run out of split coin, I replied shortly. Simona bit her fingernails and stared down towards the floor in silence. I could sense that she was conflicted and didn't know what to do. I thought of influencing her, but decided not to. 
This was her choice to make. Eventually, she looked up and spoke to me with a righteous conviction. I'll help you for free on one condition, that you are taking me with you. You want to come with me to the tunnels under the Solomon's temple? I asked with a confused voice and then added in. But why? Simona looked at me with a serious face and spoke. The Mossad agent, his name is Ben Yehuda, he murdered a dear friend of mine. Whatever he's after, I intend to stop him. You'll be up against some very dangerous men. I'm not sure I can keep you safe, I said with a grave voice. Simona looked at me with a confused expression and replied, So you're worried about me, but not about yourself? I nodded and replied, Yes, I can foresee my future and I know the date of my death. The 25th of November, 2131, over 94 years from now. I haven't seen your destiny though, as it is outside the scope of my powers. Simona shook her head, laughed and spoke. You are crazy, Sabina. Do you know that? I smiled at her and replied, Yes, I have been told. Well, at least we are on the same page. So, am I coming with you? Simona asked. Sure, I can use all the help I can get, I replied. Great, I'm heading home now to gather our equipment and make fake IDs for both of us. Simona said and then she took off before waiting for my answer. When Simona had left, I felt a sense of melancholy gripping my body. Simona was young, lively, had a pure soul, and we could become good friends, but I was certain that she wouldn't make it through this ordeal alive.